Hello and welcome. This is Mr. Betts of the Theology Department of Cleveland St. Ignatius High School. Um, today's video is going to be focused on the Gospel of Matthew and a selection of readings that I will read to you. Um, and then we'll talk about a basic summary and a deeper understanding or meaning for those passages. In order to do that, I'm going to simultaneously uh, share a screen with you that uh, is a worksheet um, for my students to help you go through the stories. These are parable stories in the Gospel of Matthew. So the first passage we're going to look at is the call of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. <clears throat> As Jesus passed out on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He heard this and said, those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So Matthew is a tax collector, we learn in Matthew chapter 9, um, and Jesus goes up to him and asks him to follow, uh, and Matthew does. And the Pharisees are asking why Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus says those who are well don't need a physician, and that Jesus desires mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus came to call sinners. So what's the figurative or deeper meaning here? Well, certainly just that Jesus calls sinners, like Matthew, who's a tax collector, and tax collectors were known to be sinners. They were skimming off the top, cheating out their own people to, to keep their jobs. And so Jesus is one who is here for those who are lost, who are missing the mark, who are sinning. And mercy is seen as superior to temple sacrifice and ritual purity, which is important, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, to distinguish. Number two, Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 31, the healing of two blind men. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Son of David, have pity on us. When he entered the house, the blind men approached him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can do this? Yes, Lord, they said to him. Then he touched their eyes and said, Let it be done for you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. Jesus warned them stern sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the word of him through all that land. So basic summary, two blind men follow Jesus. They ask for mercy. They call him son of David, and they say, have pity on us. Jesus asks if they had faith. They both say, yes, Lord. Jesus touches them, and they're healed. He tells them to tell no one about the healing. So son of David is a messianic title for Jesus. Uh, this is an indication that they know that Jesus is divine, that he is Lord. And many times in the gospel, the physically deformed uh, often understand who Jesus really is. And those who are healed are more than just physically healed. They're brought back into community. They can participate. They're no longer outcasts. That's important. They are healed as a result of their faith. Yes, Jesus touches them, um, their eyes, and he says, let it be done for you according to your faith. But they're not just healed physically. There's, there's a whole lot of... Um, communal healing and welcoming back that happens in Matthew 9, 27 to 31. Picking grain on the Sabbath, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus was going through a field of grain on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, See, your disciples are doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did? when he and his companions were hungry, how he went into the house of God and ate the bread of offering, which neither he nor his companions, uh, but only the priest could lawfully eat? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests serving in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. If you knew what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned these innocent men. For the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. So basically, the disciples are hungry. They're walking through a field, and as they walk through the field, they pluck heads of grain to eat. And the Pharisees said that the disciples were doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Jesus responds saying something greater than the temple is here. He desires mercy, not sacrifice. So picking grain on the Sabbath was equal to reaping, which is forbidden in Exodus 34, maybe verse 31. And Jesus has authority over the law 
and is here to interpret the laws that do exist that he's going to keep. He doesn't come to abolish the law, but fulfill it. So Jesus wants mercy towards one another over sacrifice in order to appear holy. Jesus reminds us that he's the Lord and he feeds the hungry, both literally and spiritually. Number four, a tree and its fruit. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Either declare the tree good and its fruit is good, or declare the tree rotten and its fruit is rotten, for a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you say good things when you are evil? For from the fullness of the heart the mouth speaks. A good person brings forth good out of a store of goodness, but an evil person brings forth evil out of a store of evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will render an account for every careless word they speak. By your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. So literally, Jesus says a tree is good and is known by good fruit. A tree is bad and produces bad fruit, uh, and you'll know a tree by its fruit. So you can tell by the fruit what kind of tree it is. So what's really going on here? Well, there's a couple of things. One, basically, our speech and actions are evidence of our character. And so God will know who we truly are by how we act. Actions often speak louder than words. Um, so the story can also be a response to Jesus driving out demons. The Pharisees and others were trying to figure out if he was good or evil, this one that was driving out demons. And so the logic here is if Jesus can drive out demons, which we know demons are bad and driving them out is good, then the source of that fruit must also be good, thus Jesus. So if driving out demons is, is good, uh, the source of that is good. It's also a not so subtle condemnation of hypocrisy. Uh, it's not who you say you are, it's how you act that matters most. Number five, the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, one through 15. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, Sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil. It sprang up at once, because the soil was not deep. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit a hundred or sixty or thirtyfold. Whoever has ears, ought to hear. And it goes on, but the, the point here is, you know, there's seed sown in rocky soil and thorny soil and good soil. What's, what's the true meaning here? The seed is a metaphor for God's law. I've heard it explained as God's word or and God's kingdom. And the land is a person or people who receive it. So the seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. Uh, evil comes and steals that away because it hasn't been um, sown deeply enough and accepted. Seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it with joy, but there are no roots, and so it doesn't last. So they say yes, but it, it doesn't stick. When something difficult in life happens, this person falls away from faith. The seed sown among thorns is one who hears the word, but worldly anxiety uh, and the lure of riches chokes it. And the seed sown on rich soil, which is the goal, is to provide rich soil for the seed, is the one who hears the word and understands it, who bears fruit. So obviously, figuratively, this is not about uh, a sower farming or seeds at all. It's about how we as people, as a society, accept the word of God, the kingdom of God, the law of God, or not. Number six, the parable of the mustard seed. Matthew 13, 31 through 32. He proposed another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a person took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, yet when full grown, it is the largest of plants. It becomes a large bush, and the birds of the sky come and dwell in its branches. So literally, the mustard seed is the smallest seed that can lead to becoming a very large tree. Figuratively, deeper meaning, uh, this is about the kingdom of God. This whole section is about the kingdom of God. 
And uh, the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, often begins like something very small and grows to become something potentially very large if the soil is proper. The kingdom of God may begin in one's heart, seemingly invisibly like the seeds of the mustard uh, plant, and can transform even a nation, which is obviously something very visible and very tangible. Number seven, more parables, Matthew 13, 44 to 50. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field, which a person finds and hides again, and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea, which collects fish of every kind. When it is full, they haul it ashore and sit down to put what is good into buckets. What is bad, they throw away. Thus, it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. So the more parable section in Matthew is, again, focused on the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't use God out of respect for his uh, Jewish uh, Christian audience. But Jesus here is saying the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field that someone finds. It's like a merchant in search of finding one pearl of great value, the pearl, of course, being the kingdom. Uh, more deeply, the kingdom of God has great value. It's, it's like something hidden um, that is worth a lot, a lot of money. It's worth searching for. In fact, it's worth sacrificing other areas of our life to discover you would do the same for a great pearl or a great treasure. How much more should we for the kingdom, which will help us determine whether or not we end up in the uh, fiery furnace or not, according to Matthew chapter 13, verse 50. The feeding of the 5,000, Matthew 14, 13 through 21. When Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place and it is already late. Dismiss the crowd so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, there's no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, five loaves and two fish are all we have here. Then he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting women and children. So they're in a deserted place. There's a, a large crowd. Uh, Jesus attracted large crowds. People follow him. The disciples are worried about feeding the crowds. Jesus takes the five loaves, two fish. He takes, he blesses, he breaks. And there's 12 baskets full even left over after everyone is fed. So what's the deeper meaning? This is a nature miracle. Um, there are nature miracles and healing miracles for certain in the New Testament the Gospels. And listen, miracles are scientifically unexplainable. They're an act of power and to wonder at. Uh, Dynamice and mirari is the Greek. Uh, it's a wilderness feeding. And the, the point here is God is our ultimate nourishment, and God can literally feed us physically and spiritually. Uh, you'll notice a few things. The Jewish meal structure is um, used here, the take, bless, break, and give. That comes up again, of course, in uh, the, the Mass and the Sacrament of the um, Eucharist. The biblical number of seven, five loaves plus two fish is utilized, plus 12, likely representing the 12 tribes of Israel. So Matthew especially, trying to connect with his uh, Jewish Christian audience with these numbers. Number nine, walking on water, Matthew 14, 22, 33. Then he made the disciples get into the boat and proceed him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves. For the wind was against it. 
During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So Jesus made the disciples get in the boat. He went up to the mountain. The disciples in the boat um, notice it's being battered by the waves. And Jesus, during the fourth watch, comes walking to them on the sea. He says, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter is called out to get out of the boat and walk, and he does, but then he says, Lord, save me, and Jesus does. So another nature miracle here, and the the biggest point, takeaway, is that Jesus has dominion over nature, that um, science and faith certainly can um, work together, but when it comes right down to it, Christ faith in our Lord um, gives more power even than science has. And so true faith knows that help is in Christ and we need not worry or fear. And even Peter, uh, an apostle, if you're Catholic, our first leader of the church, our first pope, has fear and doubts. And Jesus helps those subside. But it's important to remember uh, the human side of faith uh, by noting the walking on water. I want to take a moment just to make sure that we are all together here. Uh, should still be recording. I wonder how you're doing. These are great passages to pray over as well as to study. Um, and hopefully you can use the screen to jot down some notes and more. There's way more to say. Uh, I recommend the Sacra Pagina um, book series as commentaries on the scripture. They're great. Um, also, uh, author uh, Father Felix Just, who is a Jesuit has a website um, that you can use. He's a great uh, biblical uh, scholar as well. Let's continue um, with our worksheet here. Number 10, the conditions of discipleship, Matthew 16, 24 through 28. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Amen, I say to you. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Literally, whoever wishes to come after Jesus must deny himself, take up his cross or her cross, and follow Jesus. Those who lose their life for Jesus' sake will find it. Whoever wishes to save his or her life will lose it. Everyone will be repaid according to their conduct. Figuratively, Discipleship means facing and embracing our own crosses or challenges in the world's needs. We may figuratively or literally lose our lives or be challenged for pursuing Jesus and the kingdom of God, but in the end, we will actually gain eternal life for the sacrifice. Uh, it's, it's more than just being a person of sacrifice. This passage indicates a Christian paradigm or way of seeing all of reality. A disciple is a learner or doer of the way, and there are certain conditions or requirements for this way. Number 11, the greatest in the kingdom, Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples approached Jesus and said, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over and placed it in their midst and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one child such as this in my name 
receives me. The disciples literally are approaching Jesus and ask who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and his answer is children. Becoming humble like a child, becoming like a child in many different ways will help us understand Jesus. And if you receive any child such as this described, you receive Christ. Uh, figuratively, the kingdom of God requires that we remain open-minded, innocent, radically loyal, uh, exuberant, like a child. A child's social status in Jesus' time was little better than a slave. So in another way, Jesus is saying we must become like servants, like slaves to Christ. Uh, St. Paul is, is very uh, strong on this passage, on uh, this message, I should say in a positive sense of the word of enslaved. You know, we, we don't just have freedom from sin, we have freedom for Christ. And the danger of growing up and getting set in our ways is that we may not remain set in the ways of true discipleship, of humility, of open-mindedness, of innocence, of radical dedication and loyalty to Christ. Number 12, the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter, approaching, asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife and children and that all his property and payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down and did him homage and said, be patient with me and I will repay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But the servant refused. Instead, he had him put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgives his brother from his heart. So the slave owes money to a king. The slave or servant is forgiven by the king, and it's a pretty hefty debt. But then the servant will not forgive a minor debt owed to him later, and he gets put in prison and essentially tortured and has to pay it back. What's this really about? Well, forgiveness and mercy, compassion, as mentioned in the story, or to suffer with, are shown to us, but are also to be shown to others. So forgiveness is to be given without limit. It's not the same as forgetting or ignoring justice that's required. That's probably a separate lecture, but forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. A famous line here, should I forgive someone seven times? And Jesus says, 77 times, or sometimes it's 70 times seven. We must practice limitless forgiveness so as to remember and model how we are forgiven. The rich young man, number 13, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Now someone approached him and said, teacher, what good must I do to gain eternal life? And he answered him, why do you ask me about the good? There's only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he asked him, which ones? And Jesus replied, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Hi, Ezra. Yeah. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all of these I have observed, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, 
Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, I say to you, it will be hard for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it will be, uh, again, I, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, for human beings, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. Then Peter said to him in reply, we have given up everything and followed you. What will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, that you have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, will yourselves sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for the sake of my name, will receive a hundred times more, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So literally, uh, the rich young man thinks he has it all set, and he really does for the most part. He says, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, he's followed all the commandments. He's kept them all. Um, but he knows there's something else. Like for him, for his vocational call, there's something else. And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and follow me. And the rich young man goes away sad. So what's, what's really going on here? Uh, the story is certainly about uh, vocation and providence and the idea that everyone is called in a unique way by God. We need to know what our specific call is and live it, and we will apparently be judged based on how we respond to our call. For this young man, uh, he had all the teachings down, but he was called to radically live a life of poverty and renouncement of material wealth, and he was not truly ready to follow Christ completely in this way. Um, Maybe that's why he approached Jesus in the first place, because otherwise he would have known um, that he had it all set. But he felt in his gut that something wasn't right. This passage is hauntingly about particular judgment and salvation. Uh, riches seem to be a specific obstacle to entering the kingdom that cannot usually be overcome by human works or power. So uh, there is a specific concern about wealth here, but I think it's more focused on this young man's call to give it up and not everybody's call necessarily. Number 14, the workers in the vineyard, Matthew 20 verses 1 through 16. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, you too go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, he found others standing around and said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the hot heat? And he said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give these last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus, the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is a story about a landowner who hires laborers throughout the day to work in his vineyard. Um, those that start at the beginning of the day around 9 a.m. end up getting paid the same as those who start at the end of the day, as late as 5 p.m. Um, anyone who comes to the vineyard and works gets paid the daily wage, regardless of when they arrive. Some are frustrated. Jesus says, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. So what's going on here? This is a deliberate challenge to a just reward. In other words, fair is not always equal in God's eyes. Now, in this particular passage, 
there is an equality of pay, which is not about money at all. It's about salvation. Uh, the kingdom, though, is really explained as not a meritocracy. It's not like the harder you work or the more you work, the more you're going to be saved. The fact that you get to the vineyard and work and show up is more important. And greed is an issue, a subtle issue here. God wants us to arrive and work, but we may all be called to arrive at different times. The true disciples seem to have an equality inherit in inheriting eternal life. Uh, true disciples also won't mind if others get, quote, saved that seem to do less work or show up later in the day. Again, it's not about workers in the vineyard. It's about salvation and God's kingdom. Number 15, the parable of the two sons, Matthew 21, 28 through 30. What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And he said in reply, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and he went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. And he said in reply, Yes, sir. But he did not actually go. Which of the two did his father's will? And they answered the first. And Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not later change your minds and believe him. So in this story, in the parable, a short story uh, with a religious meaning meant to convey uh, the purpose of Christ. A man had two sons. He goes to the first and says, go work in the vineyard. The son says no, but later he actually goes and works. The second son answers, I will go, um, but then he doesn't actually go. And then Jesus says, tax collectors and prostitutes are getting into heaven. So what's the point here? Those who are lax and following some laws can still get into the kingdom of God if they repent, turn around, and come back to God. It's not like the workers in the vineyard as much about when, as, is, as it is, if you go and how authentic your going is. Outsiders, those hated tax collectors, prostitutes, sinners, those who miss the mark, who turn away from God by not loving God's self for others, can get into the kingdom. However, those who are hypocrites and say one thing but don't act on it, don't truly believe it, that's the real issue. This passage is definitely a condemnation of hypocrisy and a broadening of the paradigm of what salvation can look like, especially for those who are marginalized or who seem to not get it, but eventually do. Number 16, the greatest command, Matthew 22, 34 through 39. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So very basically, uh, the Pharisees, hearing that the Sadducees got shaken up by Jesus, asked Jesus a question, but really they're trying to trick him. And they say, what's the greatest law? Uh, and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what's the point? Well, first of all, Jesus is citing uh, uh, Deuteronomy and the Shema that we must love God first. Um, and then he adds, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's how we best avoid sin, right? Um, everything else comes back to loving God, self, and neighbor. And our neighbor is anyone who is in need. We must love our neighbor as we love ourselves, which also means we need to love ourselves. Some folks who don't understand this teaching and, and hurt others, it's often the case that they actually don't love themselves and or God, uh, which might explain why they're turning against others. The point is this, love God, self, neighbor. Um, and that's what the law of the prophets is all about. And Jesus hasn't come to abolish that law. He's come to fulfill it. Number 17, the parable of the talents, Matthew 25, 14 through 30.
It will be as when a man who is going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to a third one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who received five talents went and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. He said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I will give you a great responsibility. Come share your master's joy. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward and said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you are faithful in small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come share your master's joy. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward and said, Master, I knew you were a demanding person, harvesting where you did not plant and gathering where you did not scatter. So out of fear, I went off and buried your talent in the ground. Here it is back. His master said to him reply, in reply, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I did not plant and gather where I did not scatter? Should you not then have put my money in the bank so I could have got it back with interest on my return? Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the darkness outside, where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Okay. So literally, these talents, um, a form of, of pay, uh, not necessarily physical talents, but these talents are given according to ability, five, two, and one. Um, yeah, five, two, and one. Sorry, I just want to make sure I got that. Man with one talent just stores it, the other two invest them. Um, and utilize them more. They they did more with what they had. Master comes back to settle the accounts. Um, the folks who had five and two who made more don't get in trouble. They receive the master's joy. And the one with one talent that didn't invest it, didn't produce anything with it, um, does not receive the master's joy. It gets um, thrown into the darkness outside. So figuratively or more deeply, don't lose hope or patience in pursuing the kingdom and being a disciple. Remain prepared. Invest what you have. Don't hide it away. Also, God won't give you uh, more than you can handle, but God gives us what we can handle. The worst thing we can do with what we've been given is not utilize it um, to better ourselves, our friends, our enemies in this world. Uh, we're called to, quote, invest it um, radically. And that's not necessarily, this is not a prosperity gospel passage. It shouldn't be read literally like that, although if you know the stock market, sometimes that's true. If you invest uh, wisely, you can gain money. But the point is that with talents, with what God has given us, we need to invest them and that God will come back and check on it. So number 18, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, the sheep and the goats. also known as the judgment of the nations. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. A stranger and you welcomed me. Naked and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me. In prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you. Whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. A stranger and you gave me no welcome. Naked and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs? And he will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So the famous general judgment story, uh, at the end of time, Jesus comes back to judge the nations. Uh, chronological time seems to have stopped, and we're in God's time, or Kairos now. He separates people into two groups, the sheep and the goats. The sheep are those who gave food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, welcomed the stranger, cared for the sick, clothed the naked, and visited the imprisoned. The goats did not do any of this. When people helped or didn't help the poor and marginalized around them, they were actually helping or not helping Jesus. So in a, in a deeper sort of way, this is an account of the general judgment. Uh, we believe that we'll all be judged individually be a particular judgment at the time of our death. Uh, however, this judgment, this general judgment, focuses on all the people of the world and their fruit of character or how they acted in the world. Uh, it's more of a reflection than a, a, an additional judgment. We don't believe we're judged twice, but acting with mercy will help people know salvation. And denying our brothers and sisters is like denying Christ. This is where we get the corporal and spiritual works of mercy from. And it's a good way to judge if we're living the message of Christ or not in our daily lives. Uh, at St. Ignatius High School, think about the Christian action team. In Matthew 25, 31 to 46, it makes a whole lot of sense. And finally, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, approached, rolled back the stone, and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards were shaking with fear of him and became like dead men. Then the angel said to the women in reply, Do not be afraid. I know that you are seeking Jesus, the crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Then they went away quickly from the tomb, fearful yet overjoyed, and ran to announce this to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them on their way and greeted them. They approached, embraced his feet, and did him homage. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Uh, so this is the appearance of Jesus in the resurrection, um, first in Galilee in Matthew 28. And later on down the passage, the last verse in Matthew's gospel is Matthew 28, verse 20. And it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. A reference back to the, to the very beginning that God, Jesus, is Emmanuel, or God with us. I hope this has been helpful for you. This is a review of a number of passages in the Gospel of Matthew. Again, my name is Mr. Fetz, St. Ignatius High School Theology Department. Uh, make it a great day, and thanks for reading uh, God's Holy Word with me today. Look forward to future uh, videos. And as always, go Wildcats.